Awesome. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Leanne Chapton. I just want to say that I'm super excited to be here, so thank you for having me. I am a software developer at Shopify. I believe this talk is well positioned right after Nix because Shopify is a monolithic app. It's kind of one giant Ruby on Rails app um, with some exceptions. So for those who don't know, uh, Shopify is an e-commerce platform that makes it easy to sell products online. Like other platforms, Shopify does encourage um, third-party developers to build their own apps and services on top of our software. And the work I primarily do at Shopify is extending our platforms to enable developers to do this. So at Shopify, we use GraphQL. Our uh, mobile app is completely backed by GraphQL, as well as parts of our web app. Even our third-party developers can use our Shopify GraphQL APIs to build their own apps. So what I'd like to talk about today is how we redesigned our APIs in GraphQL. I'm going to describe our process, as well as share some guidelines that we've developed over the, uh, along the way um, based on lessons learned. So hopefully you'll find this helpful. Um, GraphQL became part of our stack at Shopify. Uh, around 2015, um, we were looking to rewrite our mobile apps. And at the time, it was hard to scale mobile because you had to write it all of your features twice in two different languages by two different teams, each lo learning the domain separately. So GraphQL helped us to move a lot of that uh, logic onto the server, and is a reason we use GraphQL instead of some of our traditional APIs. So a year later, we were able to release our mobile app that was rewritten on top of GraphQL. And then in 2017 was the first time we used GraphQL publicly with our release of our storefront GraphQL API. Uh, this year, we have also publicly released more GraphQL APIs. We've released the full functionality of our admin uh, REST-based APIs, and we've offered them in GraphQL. So over the last three years, we have written a lot of GraphQL APIs, and I'm going to explain kind of how we did that. And in part, it has to do with how we're structured at Shopify. So each team at Shopify is um, structured around a particular component. So each team works on a particular component of the app, and they know they're responsible for that business domain. So because they're responsible for that business domain, they're also responsible for exposing those features through GraphQL. So our teams are experts in their domain, but not necessarily GraphQL. So we have a guiding team called the API Patterns team that drives consistency amongst the APIs that are developed at Shopify. So today, I'm going to go through a list of guidelines that are actually developed by the API Patterns team to make sure that all the GraphQL APIs that are developed by these component teams are consistent and follow best practices. So we're going to imagine that we are one of these component teams. We are the collections team today. Collections are just a group of products. It makes it easy for um, users that are searching your store to find particular products. For example, a collection could be summer clothing. So you would navigate to the summer clothing collection to find all your summer clothing. There are two different types of collections. There are manual collections and automatic collections. Automatic collections just mean products are automatically published to this particular collection if they follow a particular rule. So products that are maybe take su summer would be automatically um, published to the collections, summer collection if there was a rule to do so. Manual collections are products have to be manually published to those collections, and they don't have a rule. Some attributes that collections have are a title, they'll have an image, and a description. So as the collection component team, we have successfully implemented this um, feature in Shopify's backend. It's also important to note our GraphQL APIs aren't built on top of our REST APIs. They are kind of operate in parallel. So now we're in charge of exposing this collections feature through GraphQL. So where do we start? Uh, designing APIs is hard. Designing GraphQL APIs is also complicated. So what we want to do is take a step back and focus on the high-level objects and their relationships. So we're not going to be concerned with fields or mutations at this point. We'll get to that later. So a way to do this is you can build an entity relationship model where you can show, sorry, that's not super clear, but I'll explain what's on the slide. Um, so you can explain the objects and the relationships between them. So here we have a collections, 
it can be of one of two types, automatic and manual. The automatic collections have a rule. And then there's this thing called collection memberships that join uh, products to collections. So one of our first guidelines is always start with a high level view of objects and their relationships. So now that we have this kind of high level view, you can point out one major flaw in our design. And if you haven't seen it yet, it's this collection membership thing. So collections membership is a join table that joins our products table to our collections table. This is an implementation detail and doesn't need to appear in our API. So don't expose implementation, implementation details in your API. So we can get rid of this. From a business domain perspective, all the client cares about is that products are collected or belong to collections and collections have many products. They don't care about this thing called collection membership. Now that we've refined our high level view a bit more, um, there is also another flaw in our design. But this is harder to find unless you know the domain really well. So going back to collections, collections exist because they group products. The way that collections are pub or the way products are published to a collection is secondary. So this type of manual and automatic collections is actually just another implementation detail and shouldn't be in our business de design. So we can simplify our high level view even further by just having one tech, uh, type called collections and that collection could have a rule or not. So our manual collections, you can see that the field rules is a list. Um, so for our manual collections, it just wouldn't have any lists or any rules. With our automatic collections, it would. So our second or third guideline is design your API around the business domain. Don't just simply repeat um, or blindly, blindly follow your implementation or user interface or maybe a legacy API. So now that we have this kind of minimal or high level view, we can add it back in our fields. But it's easier to add fields than remove them. So don't add a field unless there's a use case or a business case for it. Because um, if you change or remove that field later, that's a breaking change and can be much more difficult. So here's the fields that we added in based on business uh, or client use cases. And let's look at the first field here, ID. So ID is important to identify the collection, probably for modifying or deleting the collection later. But what we want to do is implement the node interface. So a lot of common GraphQL schemas use this node interface, and so do we. It signifies to the client that this um, object is persistent in the database and can be retrievable by its ID. The next two fields here are rules and rules applied disjunctively. So I talked about this before, but um, Rules are just a list of rules that will be returned. So for manual collections, this would return an empty list. But then the rules applied disjunctively means that for a product to be published to this collection, it either has to follow all rules or only just has to uh, follow one of the rules. So this will return true or, true or false. This rises a problem with manual collections because what do we return here? So our next guideline can probably help us out. Group closely related fields together into sub-objects. So we'll notice here that these two fields share prefix rules. This will hint to us that this um, can probably be indicated in our GraphQL schema, this relationship. So we're going to actually pull it out into its own type called collection rule set, where you have rules and applied disjunctively will return true or false. So now manual collections just won't have a rule set. The next field here is products. So products returns a, an array or a list of products. Collections can return tens of thousands of um, products. So this would be really inefficient and, ex and expensive. So what we want to do is paginate here. So it's important to look at your fields and check whether they should be paginated. Our general guideline is if a list returns more than a dozen elements, you should paginate. Image ID. So right now we're returning an image ID. This is common in our REST-based APIs to return IDs to link objects together. But with GraphQL, because clients explicitly ask for each field, we don't need to do this. We can actually provide the object reference right in, um, in our field and avoid the client having to come back to the server to get what they want. So always use object references instead of ID fields. The last field here in collections is body HTML. That's not a great name. 
What it means is that it's a body description of a collection. So let's take the opportunity here to rename it to description. So choose field names based on what makes sense. Not a legacy API field or maybe a name of the column in your database. Um, be really descriptive with your names. Also, we can change, right now, description is returning string. GraphQL allows you to define your own scalar types, and this is probably a prime use case to do so. So we can actually, description should be, uh, is actually valid HTML, so we'll define our own HTML scalar value. GraphQL comes with scalar values out of the box, like integer, um, string, or Boolean, but we can define our own. So using custom scalar types when you're exposing something with specific semantic value. Also, GraphQL has enums, so use them. Use enums for fields which can only take a specific set of values. So here, this is a bit of a um, change from the last time you saw a collection rule, but their collection rules can only be one of a certain level of values. So we can, this is a prime case to use enums here. So now we have a minimally well-designed API, but we don't address all of our client needs effectively. For example, we return products as a paginated list, but say our client wants to know whether a particular product belongs to a particular collection. Right now, they have to grab the collection, grab the products, and iterate through the products on their side to find whether the product of interest belongs to that actual collection. So this is extremely inefficient because as we know, collections can return tens of thousands of products, as well as every single client that wants to do that would have to write code on their side to figure this out. So our GraphQL API can help out a bit here, and we're actually going to remove, take this logic and put it on this GraphQL API. So we are going to have this field called has products. The client passes an ID of the product, and we return true or false whether it belongs in the collection. So these complex calculations should be done on the server in one place instead of on the client in many places. So our GraphQL API becomes a single source of truth for business logic. It also a caveat to this guideline is even though you have this has product field, you still want to return the products because you don't know, you can't really predict all of the logic that the client will want as well as you, the client may not want to query your API and do the logic on their side, so provide the raw data too, even when there's business logic around it. So our um, schema right now is missing mutations. So if we blindly follow kind of what, if we design our mutations like we do in REST-based APIs, we'll notice that, and uh, CRUD operations, we'll notice that our uh, update um, mutation becomes quite large quite quickly, because it's responsible for not updating stuff like the title in the collection, but also publishing and unpublishing products. This is hard for the server to implement, and also hard for the client to reason about. So we can take advantage of um, the power of GraphQL and write separate mutations for separate logical actions on a resource. So we have collection update where you can update the title, but also have things like collection publish and collection unpublish when you want to publish or unpublish a product to a particular collection. We don't have to follow CRUD. Um, thinking about um, publishing and unpublishing collections to pro or products to collections, this is manipulating a relationship between two objects, and it's tricky. So I don't, unfortunately, have a snappy rule for this one, but I have a few styles in which you could write your mutations that manipulate object relationships. The first one here is embedding the entire relationship. This works well for smaller relationships. So we saw a collection rule set. This might be a good opportunity to use this type of mutation, where on collection update, you embed um, the actual collection rule set object as you is part of that mutation. This doesn't work so well for larger relationships, so we can actually just embed, if you want it to um, publish all your products on collection update, you could pass in delta fields, so the, just the ideas of the products that you want to publish um, as a type of mutation, or you can just write separate mutations. This is actually what we decided to do, where you add products is its own separate mutation instead of embedding it into another um, mutation. So these are a few different examples of what, what you could use, but it depends on the relationship um, that you're mutating, as well as the 
a good thing about separate mutations is you have the most power and control and it's flexible. It is the most work, but you can preserve things like ordering and is another reason that we chose it. Um, also, because it's GraphQL, consider whether it would be useful for the mutations to operate on multiple elements at once. So we know our clients like to add, remove, and reorder products, more than one product at once, so we will add these mutations for convenience. So we're adding collection add products and collection remove products, as well as part of our mutation list. GraphQL doesn't have a way to organize or group mutations. It just lists them in alphabetical order. So we get around this by naming our mutations a certain way. So we always use the core type of the product or the object um, first. So instead of saying create collection, we call it collection create. So when the list is alphabetical, the collection mutations will all be grouped together. So prefix mutation names with the object they are mutating for alphabetical grouping. So when we were designing our read API, um, we noticed we would put an exclamation mark to denote that something was non-nullable. This takes on a different meaning, meaning when we um, design our input fields. So when we use an exclamation mark in our input fields, this means this particular field is required for the mutation to uh, succeed. So when we look at create and update, cr title is required on create, but it isn't required on update. You don't need to always update your title or pass it in if you're not updating. So only make input fields required if they're actually semantically required for the mutation to proceed. Also talking about requiring certain fields, um, GraphQL will do validation before the mutation is even run. So if you require a particular field, you'll get an error if you haven't, the client will get an error if they haven't included it. So we have some guidelines around this because, so there's validation errors that happen at the GraphQL layer, but you might also have business level validation errors. Um, so to make this simple for the client, we only use strong typer, types for inputs when the format may be ambiguous and the client-side validation is simple. So that's a mouthful, but we don't have a field type here, but if we had something that were termed date, that's simple for the client to validate, as well as date can come in a lot of different formats. So it is ambiguous. So we want to um, make the client have stricter input rules around that. But for something like HTML, which is harder to validate on the client side, that the format is not unambiguous because HTML is well-defined, we can actually do the non-trivial validations on the business layer and um, only return one error to the client. Also, just quickly, um, we can see that our collection create and collection update more or less contain the same input fields, so we recommend structuring mutation inputs to reduce duplication. So even though the update requires an ID, but that's not available on create, as well as create requires a title, but you don't need it on update, we would relax some of the constraints to make sure that you have one input um, type for a particular mutation. This makes it easier for the client because they can share code between their update and create forms, um, but the one obvious downside is that it's not, uh, you can't tell from the schema that you have to include title on create. So I just have a few more guidelines, um, and they all, or a couple more guidelines, they all are around um, the return value that you get from a mutation. So mut GraphQL supports query level errors, so like if you're asking for a non-existent field, but not, doesn't well support, or it's not ideal for business layer errors. Um, so what we do on our payload that we return following a mutation, we always have this thing called a user error field that returns a list of uh, errors. So mutation should provide user or business level errors via user error field on the mutation payload. So every single mutation payload that we define in our schema always has this field called user errors that provides a list of any user errors that represent the user or business level errors. Another th important thing to note is that all of the fields in our pay, uh, in all most payload fields for a mutation should be not nullable because, for example, if collection create fails, there's no collection to return. So this should be nullable. All right, I have 20 seconds left. Um, so I wanted to share the list of guidelines that I presented today. These are guidelines that we follow at Shopify to design our um, APIs. I will also tweet out a link if you're unable to capture it now. 
But this uh, Scott Walkinshaw from our API patterns team published a uh, public gist of all the uh, guidelines, as well as there's more description around some of the rules. So if you found this helpful, please check this out, and it's a good summary. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.